Whitney Vallow was known to almost everyone who had ever crossed the threshold of the local clinic. The therapist worked tirelessly and always helped those in need. While this might seem unremarkable, Whitney was truly special. Beyond her regular appointments, she took the initiative to meet with those who, because of their low social status, were unlikely to seek help. Do you really need to bother with these vagrants, Whitney? The whole clinic already looks at you askance, her husband used to say. She'd merely shrug. Let them look. That's all they know how to do. But no one can forbid me from using my personal stethoscope outside the clinic. Dave wrinkled his nose. Whitney was always like that, and her colleagues secretly laughed at her. However, patients adored the doctor. Part of her popularity stemmed from the video blog she maintained, offering residents valuable health advice. Today, the day stretched like a rubber band. Sitting in her office, Whitney glanced out the window periodically. It was overcast, the sky blanketed with clouds, threatening rain. Whitney, may I leave early today? I live in the suburbs and need to catch the bus. The weather's awful, and I forgot my umbrella, the nurse asked cautiously. Whitney looked up from her paperwork and nodded. Of course, go ahead. The day's almost over anyway, and it's unlikely anyone else will come in. A sweet smile immediately played on the nurse's lips. Thank you. You're the best doctor I've ever worked with. Whitney smiled back and glanced out the window again. At that moment, a jagged bolt of lightning flashed, and a second later, the office windows rattled with a powerful clap of thunder. The nurse yelped and hurried out the door. Whitney shook her head disappointedly. She would have to ask her husband to pick her up from work, but Dave had, as luck would have it, agreed to help his mother with repairs. Miranda, true to form, decided to start it at the most inconvenient moment. Whitney was due for a vacation in two weeks. They planned to go to the seaside for at least a few days. Whitney couldn't manage much more than that. After all, how would her poor patients be without her, who, when necessary, even came to her home? Suddenly there was a knock at the door. Whitney glanced anxiously at the clock on the wall. Five minutes until the end of the workday. For many of her co-workers... This was reason enough to lock up and go home with a clear conscience. But she'd always tried to stick to the rules. After all, they existed for a reason. Come in, Whitney said, turning towards the door. To her surprise, a boy of about ten years old crossed the threshold. Luca, what are you doing here? She couldn't help but ask. Whitney knew this little orphan, who occasionally ran away from the orphanage roaming the city in search of small treasures, like candy or fresh pastries. She'd met Luca at the supermarket checkout, where a guard had caught him with a bun in his hands. Tears had frozen in the boy's eyes. He wasn't a thief at all. The change he'd carefully collected had simply fallen through a hole in his pants pocket. Luca stood at the register, smearing tears across his dirty cheeks. Whitney didn't hesitate. She resolutely approached the guard, paid for the bun. Well, look at you. This is how beggars and swindlers are made. You shouldn't encourage this behaviour in children. Someone called after her. But Whitney didn't care. The important thing was that she had helped this boy, and such misfortunes could happen to anyone. Since then, Luca and Whitney had become friends. They didn't see each other often, but sometimes she'd help the kid by buying sweets for him and his friends at the orphanage. She usually gave him a small box of baked goods or bought fruit. This didn't mean the children in the orphanage were malnourished. Rather, it was something else. Sweets and fruit were always delicacies for the kids, perpetually in short supply. Hi, Luca. Did you just come for a visit? Or has something happened? Whitney asked. The boy looked at the woman with an odd expression, then said, Yes, I have a problem, or rather, not me, Mr. Thompson. He lives at the dump. Yesterday, he found a man who's unconscious and delirious. He has a high fever, and his clothes were totally wet. Mr. Thompson thinks 
It's some kind of cold. He doesn't know what medicine to give him. Will you come and see him, please? She hesitated. The boy was asking her to go to the city dump in this weather. Not the most pleasant prospect, certainly. What can I say, Luca? Isn't there another way? Maybe he could come to our clinic? In case he needs a chest x-ray. Whitney, you know Mr. Thompson's health is failing. There's no way this man can be carried by him. He's too old and weak. We wanted to call an ambulance, but the road is dug up, and with the rain they can't get through. That's how it is. You're our only hope, Luca pleaded. Whitney looked out the window again. The clouds were thickening, and the walk to the garbage dump threatened to be troublesome. But the boy's words stirred an uneasiness in her soul. What if she was the very last hope for this poor man? Clearly, he wasn't at the dump by choice. Such is life. All right, Luca, let's go now. You say it's a cold? So that I'll buy some medicine at the pharmacy. Of course, this isn't the proper way to do things, but apparently there's no other option. Whitney decided, and grabbing her purse, headed for the door. A satisfied smile appeared on Luca's lips. From his eyes, Whitney could tell he was delighted with her decision. Whitney knew that the boy's parents had died in an accident. They lived in the village, keeping a small farm with a cow, chickens and geese. They sold their produce at the city market, earning a modest but stable income. That fateful day, there was a thick fog. The neighbour persuaded not to go, saying that she had a bad dream and that she should not ignore the omens. But Luca's parents didn't believe in such things. Let's go anyway, they said. We can't miss a market day when trade is in full swing. We've been dreaming of repairing the house. Our son is three years old, and he still doesn't have a proper nursery. Their neighbour wept, trying to dissuade them. But there was no stopping them. They drove into the fog towards their death, which appeared before them in the form of a truck that veered into the oncoming traffic lane. Luca's father died instantly. His mother lingered in a coma for just over a week before joining her husband in the afterlife. The neighbour tried to keep the baby, but social services refused, citing her age and poor health. So Luca ended up in an orphanage, where he has been raised to this day. Among the educators, he was known as a boy with talent, for amateur art and sports competitions. However, pursuing the latter was problematic due to the orphanage's sports ground being in destitute condition. But Luca wasn't discouraged. He practised in the city park. Whitney's sad reverie was interrupted by a clap of thunder overhead. Startled, Luca jumped up and looked resentfully at the sky. "'Don't worry, my little friend. Everything will be all right. It'll rumble for a bit, then stop.' Whitney smiled and quickened her pace. On the way, they stopped at a pharmacy to buy some essential medicines for treating colds. After that, Whitney took the boy by the hand and led him to the bus stop. It seemed safer that way. It might be raining, but they'd have a roof of the bus over their heads. Thunder rumbled and lightning flashed all around, but oddly, there was no rain. The air seemed charged with energy that couldn't find its release. A sense of moisture hung in the air, eager to fall upon the city. Sitting by the window, Luca watched with interest as passers-by scurried back and forth on their various errands, urgent and not so urgent, the usual measured life of a large anthill. Having reached the terminus, Whitney and Luca got off the bus and headed towards the dump identifiable by the characteristic smoke that from afar looked more like a ghostly haze. Whitney wrinkled her nose at the vile stench, carried by the oncoming wind. Luca, however, led her confidently, seemingly unperturbed by the dump's discomfort. For a moment, Whitney even suspected that the boy had been here more than once, visiting Mr. Thompson. She was acquainted with this elderly man, who was passionate about painting, and even collected discarded postcards and photocopies of famous paintings from the garbage. Before, he wasn't a vagrant at all. 
It was just that after his son died, his daughter-in-law kicked him out of his apartment. Mr. Thompson hadn't achieved fame in the art world and had reduced his painting to a hobby, a pastime for the soul. He was something of a free artist, living in the vast expanses of the city dump. Carefully following Luca, Whitney gingerly avoided the spontaneous mountains of garbage that appeared in their path. At the moment, she was concerned with only one thing. What had happened to the homeless man whom Mr. Thompson had sheltered? And while she, struggling with the increasing foul odour, waded through the garbage, Luca had already run up to the small house. The dwelling was tiny, with only two windows, constructed of old planks and lined with iron. Pieces of slate substituted for tiles on the floor. Whitney doubted the shelter's sturdiness, but with each passing minute the sky grew darker, threatening a heavy downpour. "'Mr. Thompson, we're here!' exclaimed Luca, peering through the leaning door. There was no answer. "'Mr. Thompson, where are you?' Luca repeated, tapping on the doorframe. Whitney was standing nearby, observing the scene. "'Mr. Thompson?' she tried calling. Silence replied. At last the door opened, and a thin elderly man with a pale face appeared on the threshold. He looked at them with sad eyes, that conveyed not only pain, but also a kind of longing. "'Mr. Thompson!' cried Luca, running up to him and hugging him around the shoulders. Whitney approached cautiously. Hello, he answered. Come in. Inside it was dark and smelled of dampness and stale air. A stove stood in the corner, with a cast-iron kettle atop it. The walls were adorned mostly with landscapes and portraits of passers-by, which Mr. Thompson had drawn from life. Where is the sick man? Whitney inquired cautiously. Here he is. I laid him on the bed. He was delirious, even frightened, babbling incomprehensibly. Then the poor fellow lost consciousness, said Mr. Thompson. Whitney approached the man, lying on the makeshift bed. He appeared to be about thirty, with regular features, slight stubble, and an unnatural thinness. Dark circles under his eyes indicated his poor health. Placing her hand on his forehead, Whitney immediately detected a high fever. Putting her stethoscope to the patient's chest, she heard characteristic wheezing in the lungs. It was unmistakable, especially to a professional like herself. Whitney silently thanked herself for having the foresight to stop at the pharmacy and buy necessary supplies. Though she realised she was acting somewhat blindly, her suspicions were now confirmed. The vagrant had a severe cold, complicated by bronchitis. "'I wish I could take him to the hospital for an X-ray,' she said, realising it was unrealistic at the moment. "'Yes, I understand, Whitney, but please do something. I've tried giving him medicine and tea with raspberries, but to no avail,' Mr. Thompson pleaded. And I brought honey, added Luca, but Whitney only shook her head. I'm sorry, but in such severe cases, folk remedies rarely help. I'll leave some medicine. You must administer it strictly on schedule. Can you manage that? Mr. Thompson visibly perked up. Of course I can. I've got plenty of time. It's not like I'm busy here in this dump, is it? This is how I live. Out of despair. If anything, I'll help look after him, Luca chimed in, making the adults chuckle. The boy's words were so touching that they brought a smile to Whitney's lips. In her heart, she knew the vagrant's condition was rather serious. They didn't even know his name. According to Mr. Thompson, he had been unconscious the whole time, only quietly delirious. Suddenly, the stranger regained consciousness and distinctly uttered a few words. Elada. Interview. Deception. Whitney shuddered and looked at the sick man in surprise. But he had already slipped back into unconsciousness, unable to say more. For Mr. Thompson and Luca, the tramp's words held no meaning. 
It's not unusual for a feverish patient to mumble nonsense. But the phrase left an indelible impression on Whitney. She went to the door and leaned against the wall to collect herself. For her, Elada wasn't just a word. It was the name of the company where her husband worked. Whitney, are you all right? asked Mr. Thompson, who had just noticed the doctor's chalk, white complexion and fixed gaze. She shook her head and looked at the shack's owner. Yes, I'm fine. Just tired from the day, that's all. I'm sorry, my dear, for taking you away from work, but when I thought that poor fellow might die on me, it made my heart ache. I almost died myself. I can't allow it myself. I still have grandchildren left, after my son, Fedenka. Whitney nodded understandingly, then opened the door and stepped outside. It still hadn't rained, but a strong wind raged, venting its fury on the city's inhabitants with powerful gusts. The tramp's words lingered in her mind. Why had he said that particular phrase? What connection could this sick man have to her husband's firm? It seemed impossible. The question nagged at her thoughts. Luca stood aside, patiently waiting for the doctor to gather herself and leave. He needed to get home, too. The orphanage teachers would soon raise the alarm, searching for him in every corner. If they found him here, they'd ban him from going out for a month. A tragedy for Luca. Few knew that once a week the boy visited the cemetery with flowers, plucked from the city flower beds. He went to his parents' grave, who had died that fateful June morning. He could barely remember their faces, knowing them only from photographs, in the niches of their modest concrete and marble-chip gravestones. Sometimes the boy would sit on a bench before the grave and recount everything that had happened to him over the past week. Life in the orphanage was never easy. Not a day went by without Luca conflicting with one of the older kids. The strong always bullied the weak, taking their valuables. The teachers loved Luca, but this made the older boys jealous. They'd take every opportunity to rough him up, always in secret when the teachers weren't looking. Of course, Luca could complain to the headmaster or teachers, but then he'd be labelled a snitch, someone who runs to tattle at the first opportunity. Well, let's go, Luca, Whitney sighed sadly. Turning to Mr. Thompson, who stood nearby, she added, Just give the medicine on schedule, okay? Don't miss a single dose. He smiled. All right, I'll do everything. Don't worry. I understand perfectly well. Whitney nodded, then took Luca by the hand and headed for the exit. Her stay at the dump left an unpleasant feeling. She didn't blame Mr. Thompson for asking for help. Rather, Whitney was angry at herself for willingly coming to such an unpleasant place. Her clothes were dirty now, and she'd have to explain the persistent odour to her husband. The tramp's delirious words kept replaying in her mind, making it difficult to focus on anything else. She found her way back easily, not needing to rely on her young guide, who had navigated the mountains of trash so well. When they finally left the dump, dusk had softly fallen. Whitney glanced furtively at her smartphone screen, but there were no calls or messages from Dave, she felt a pang of hurt that he hadn't even sent a brief text. Deep down, a sense of resentment grew, fueled by a spark of suspicion. Recently, her husband seemed changed, cold, aloof, often locking himself in his office for hours. At first, Whitney attributed it to work problems, which her husband always had plenty of. But then she learned from Dave's colleagues that the company was doing more than fine, there was nothing to complain about. So how to explain Dave's behaviour? On her friend Natasha's advice, she had repeatedly checked her husband's shirt collars for lipstick traces, or the scent of women's perfume. But there was nothing. What then could explain his unpleasant coldness? Could he have found another woman, and be carefully hiding it, savouring the delights of a secret affair? Realising it was unrealistic, to wait for a bus at such a late hour. 
Whitney decided to call a taxi. It would be much more convenient. Luca would get to the orphanage on time, and the exhausted Whitney could rest a bit gazing out the window. The cab driver turned out to be understanding. He winked at Luca, kindly opened the front door and helped Whitney into the cabin. Luca sensed something incomprehensible was going on with his acquaintance, but due to his young age, he couldn't guess what was the matter. Whitney's brain kept circling the same phrase and the name of her husband's company. She also wondered, why was this strange tramp, wet from head to toe? It hadn't rained that day, and Whitney knew it for sure. One could only get so wet in the river that divides their city in half and flows deep into the vast homeland. At that moment, Whitney was torn from her thoughts because the cab stopped at the orphanage. Kissing the boy goodbye on the cheek, she led him to the gate, where the teacher noticed them. Wait, where are you going? So it's you Luca runs away to all the time, the woman began without preamble. Whitney turned pale and involuntarily took two steps back. I don't understand what you're getting at. Yes, I know Luca, but that doesn't mean he's running away to me. The teacher wrinkled her nose. Listen, you can tell these stories to anyone you want, but not to me. I'm responsible for Luca, and if anything happens, all the teachers will be punished. In the worst case, they might even face legal consequences. Mrs. Jones, why are you like this? Luca began to plead with the teacher, but it had no effect on her. The woman looked unpleasantly at Whitney, as if she were the culprit of all their troubles. Whitney's mood soured completely. This was not the reception she had expected at the orphanage. Moreover, she wasn't really to blame for Luca turning to her for help. And if they were all so right and smart here, why did their pupils run away from them in broad daylight and wander the city, risking trouble? But Whitney didn't want to voice these thoughts. Of course, so that Luca wouldn't be punished because of her. She'd rather let the teacher believe she was responsible for his escapes than punish the child who was already suffering from living without parents. "'Excuse me, Mrs. Jones. Don't worry about Luca. He will really improve.' Whitney tried to smooth over the awkward pause. The teacher grinned, but at that moment a cab driver's horn sounded behind them, reminding Whitney that they had to go. She waved goodbye to Luca and hurried to the car. She didn't say a word the whole way. Occasionally, Looking at her in the rear-view mirror, the driver lost himself in speculation about her work. Who could this sad woman with tears in her eyes be? It seemed unlikely that she worked in an office, or was associated with hard physical labour, except for the sadness in her eyes. Talking a lot, trying to distract the passenger from sad thoughts, the chauffeur tuned the local radio station to play music. At first, it even annoyed Whitney. She wanted silence. At one point, she even opened her mouth to make a remark, when an announcement about Alfred Grolman, whom only a lazy person in the city didn't know, sounded out loud. He was a rich man, a philanthropist, who spent fabulous sums on charity, trying to help everyone in need. The first time Whitney heard about him was when he allocated new equipment for their clinic, at first she thought it was just a PR campaign to gain a reputation, but when Mr. Grolman refused to be filmed or publicised, Whitney's respect for him grew. Still, not everyone from the rich of this world would do such a deed. No matter how you spin it, one's own shirt is closer to the body, and money warms the pocket. Hearing a familiar name, Whitney listened. It turned out that an unfamiliar man had rescued Alfred Grohlman's daughter when she and her friends had gone to the river. Taking selfies on the bridge, the teenagers laughed and competed to see who would take the best picture. At some point, Bianca Grohlman leaned over the railing and fell into the water. Everything happened so quickly that no one had time to react. Some shouted for an ambulance, others waved their hands in doom, thinking that the turbulent waters of the river had already done their damage. 
only one outwardly unremarkable man, dared to dive into the water. For some time he wasn't seen, and some ill-wishers had already started saying he'd drowned with the girl. People gathered on the bridge, filming and commenting on social networks, watched what was happening. Probably at this moment, it seemed to them that they were watching a movie with a happy ending, and the director would soon inform everyone about the successful completion of filming. But this was life, harsh and cruel in its ruthlessness and attention to detail. Then suddenly, a man's head appeared on the surface. He was with a girl who clung to his shoulder, desperately trying to stay afloat. The stranger swam toward the shore, using his legs and his whole body. Even though his wet clothes were pulling him down, he held steady in the water, making sure the girl didn't suffocate. But despite his best efforts, he pulled already the senseless body of Bianca to the shore. It was impossible to delay. The stranger immediately tried to clear her lungs of water, putting her on her side. The unwilling spectators of the unfolding drama covered their eyes in horror when they thought Bianca had died, but the brave man knew what he was doing, and soon the girl began to cough hoarsely, finally clearing her lungs of water. At that moment, the police and ambulance arrived at the scene and dispersed the onlookers and eyewitnesses of the tragedy. In the commotion, the man who had saved Bianca blended into the crowd, wishing to remain anonymous. He was the one Mr. Grolman was now looking for, to thank and show the city their hero. Given Mr. Grolman's capabilities, one could only guess at the size of the reward. Ah, lucky that one. I wish I'd been in his shoes. He'd be driving a brand new car by now, the cab driver said enviously. Whitney cringed, imagining how this man with his globe-like belly would dare to jump into the speedy water. A thought suddenly struck Whitney. What if the stranger who had saved B. Anchor was actually the unknown tramp lying in Mr. Thompson's shack? Of course, this was mere speculation, possibly unrelated to reality. Most likely it was a coincidence, albeit a strange one. Mr. Thompson had mentioned seeing the stranger in soaked clothes, trying to find shelter and having a fever. The only thing Whitney couldn't understand was why the vagabond had hurried to hide and not given his name. After all, if Mr. Grolman had found out about him, he would have thanked him generously, perhaps even changed his life for the better. Finally, the cab driver announced their arrival. The key to the front door stuck in the lock, as if reluctant to let her into the house, which seemed alien and cold in the evening twilight. No lights were on in the windows, so Dave hadn't come home from work yet, assuming he'd gone at all. Whitney squeezed the key harder, pushed on the handle, and the door opened smoothly, revealing chaos inside the apartment. Dishes on the table, things scattered on the floor, traces of haste in every corner. The scene was unpleasant. Her heart clenched with anxiety, a premonition of trouble creeping into her soul. Her gaze fell on a note lying on the kitchen table, next to an unfinished cup of coffee. Whitney, I'm sorry. I can't live like this any more. Got myself into a situation you wouldn't understand. I need to go away. Don't wait for me. Dave. It was like a bolt of lightning struck her. Whitney read the note again, searching for some hint, some glimmer of hope. But the words remained strange and frightening. Thoughts swirled in her head like a whirlwind, preventing clear reasoning. Suddenly the phone rang, interrupting her sad reflection. Her mother-in-law's number appeared on the screen. Whitney, are you home? Miranda's voice trembled with excitement. Yes, she answered, trying to contain her anxiety. What happened? Dave? I can't reach him. Where is he? The mother-in-law interrupted. Miranda, I don't know either. He left a note and disappeared. Whitney replied. He says 
he got into some sort of trouble. In trouble, then, said the mother-in-law bitterly. I think because of you. Because of me? Whitney was indignant. What do you mean? What do I mean? The mother-in-law's voice rang with discontent. You can't give him what he needs. Children, peace, comfort in the house. You're a bad wife and bad mistress of the house. Whitney trembled. She had known before that her mother-in-law disliked her. Miranda had always considered her unworthy of her only son. But to lay all the blame for Dave's leaving on her was too much. How can you say that? I've been at work all day. And Dave, he was supposed to come to you to help with the repairs. Whitney whispered confusedly. And what should I say to you? Miranda hissed. Repair is just an excuse for running away from you. Whitney could not listen any longer. Her hands were trembling, and her head was spinning with anxious thoughts. Miranda, I don't want to argue with you. I don't know where he is now, and anyway, I don't know what's going on. But I don't want to listen to your reproaches. What are you talking about, dear? You shouldn't listen to me. You should act to bring Dave home as soon as possible. Her mother-in-law snapped. Contact all his friends, acquaintances, all his business partners. Call them, text them. But find him, or you'll never accomplish anything in this life. You're a complete non-entity. Whitney hung up without replying. She turned away and went to her room, feeling hurt and resentful. She had invested all her strength and emotions into this marriage, but her mother-in-law refused to acknowledge her. Miranda only wanted to see her son, to exert her power over him. She approached the window and gazed out at the dark street. The wind rustled outside, mirroring her inner turmoil. "'What shall I do now?' she murmured. "'How do I find Dave?' Her eyes fell on a small note lying on the table. She read it again. The situation remained unclear. The words felt like a sentence. "'For heaven's sake, what did I do wrong? Why did you run away?' Whitney whispered to herself. Struggling to compose herself, she decided that morning would bring clarity. What use was there in tormenting herself with thoughts of this mysterious disappearance? After a hasty shower, Whitney longed for one thing to fall asleep, to dissolve into the soft serenity of slumber, where there would be no alarm bells, no rushed rounds through hospital wards, no endless struggle for patients' lives. But her thoughts persisted like unwelcome guests. She ran her hand over the cold pillow surface and tried to close her eyes, but sleep eluded her. Suddenly, memories of the day she first met her future husband came flooding back, it had happened on a train. She was en route to a conference in the capital when she heard loud laughter nearby. Peering into the aisle, she saw a young man chatting with other passengers. The stranger wore a tracksuit and a brightly coloured T-shirt, his eyes twinkling with mirth. He was recounting how he'd lost his travelling bag at the station, and everyone was laughing. Whitney stared at the man, amazed at his inexhaustible energy. She couldn't understand how he could be so cheerful on such a tiring trip. There was something unusual about him that drew her in. As she was about to turn back, she heard behind her, Hi? You look like I've surprised you somehow. She turned again to find the stranger in the tracksuit, standing right behind her, flashing a dazzling smile. Yes, I am, Whitney replied with a small smile. I couldn't believe someone could be having so much fun on this trip. "'What's the big deal?' Dave asked. "'Do you think it's impossible to enjoy a train ride?' "'Well, I suppose not,' Whitney answered. "'But I usually sleep most of the time during trips.' "'Where are you headed?' Dave inquired. "'To a conference,' she said. "'I'm a doctor. My name's Whitney.' "'Wow, how interesting. I'm going to the capital too.' and my name is Dave Fallow. They spent the rest of the journey engrossed in conversation. Dave 
told her about his work and his dreams. Whitney listened, watching him with fascination. She admired his energy and cheerfulness. The fact that he was sales manager didn't diminish her impression. To her, Dave seemed capable of being anything, a pilot, a builder, an actor, because she saw in him boundless potential and felt in her heart an inexhaustible spirit. As Whitney bid farewell at the train station, she was unaware that a little bit of time would pass and she and Dave would become husband and wife. The next morning, Whitney awoke to the insistent ringing of her phone on the nightstand. Usually she woke up because she was pulling her hand to turn off the alarm clock, but today it had been turned off last night. She turned sideways and looked at the empty half of the bed. The phone rang again, insistent, anxious. It was the fourth time, and Whitney realised it was from work. The ringing persisted, urgent and alarming. It was the fourth call, and Whitney realised it was from work. With a heavy sigh, she answered, "'Hello, Whitney. Can you do a shift today?' the head of the department asked. "'I'm sorry, I can't. I have unforeseen circumstances.' "'What happened? Is everything all right?' "'Yes, everything's fine. I just can't come to work. I have a family problem.' "'I see. How long will it take to resolve?' the boss inquired. "'I'm not sure yet.' A few days, I suppose. All right, Whitney. Just don't forget, we're waiting for you. Yes, I won't forget. Thank you. Whitney hung up and gazed sadly at the empty half of the bed. Her mind felt vacant. She sat there, staring, unable to accept what had happened. Her husband, the man she loved, was gone. He had simply vanished, leaving no explanation, no chance for her to change his mind. Thoughts of their wedding day surfaced. It had been a beautiful day, filled with sunshine, love and hope. She had been the happiest person in the world, and she was certain that they would be together forever. The first years of their marriage had indeed been filled with love, joy and hope. They travelled extensively and made plans for the future. But lately, something had changed. Dave had become more closed off and aloof. He worked long hours, came home late, and then withdrew into himself as if distant. Whitney tried to talk to him, but he increasingly brushed her off, saying it was just work stress and fatigue. Whitney tried to be understanding. She didn't pressure him and attempted to create a comfortable atmosphere at home, so her husband wouldn't feel irritated. She even renovated the bedroom, bought a new bed with orthopedic mattress and changed the curtains but nothing helped. Dave grew more distant. I guess I just didn't know him, Whitney said aloud again, as if to convince herself. She finally got out of bed and went to the bathroom to splash cold water on her face, trying to regain her composure. She looked in the mirror. The reflection showed a young, beautiful woman, but her eyes betrayed pain and emptiness. Now what? she asked herself aloud. There was no answer to that question. Suddenly came a quiet knock at the door. Whitney flinched and went to open it, thinking her husband had returned. Luca? she asked, looking astonishingly at the boy who stood on the threshold. Hello, Whitney, he replied, hesitantly shuffling from foot to foot. I apologise for coming so early, I found out your address this morning at the hospital. What's wrong? Whitney asked, sensing trouble. That man from yesterday, he woke up. Mr. Thompson says he's been awake since morning. Lucas spoke with his usual grown-up serious demeanour. Well, let's go take a look, Whitney replied, feeling a strong wave of sympathy resurface. As a doctor, she couldn't abandon a sick person. They went out into the street. The morning was quite cool. Apparently, it had rained somewhere in the area yesterday. Luca walked beside her, silently looking at his feet. Whitney noticed he was wearing an old windbreaker that seemed too big for him, and shabby pants. Luca, how are you? 
She broke the lingering silence. Great, Luca smiled, his face immediately lighting up with childlike joy. I'm going to school today, but not really to study, though. It's summer. We have a poetry reading contest today. Wow, Whitney exclaimed in surprise. Luca, already caught up in his upcoming role, began to recite the poems he had learned for the contest. Whitney sighed with slight sadness. Childhood. How wonderful it was that children at least had childhood with its joys, dreams, and belief in fairy tales. Meanwhile, the junkyard came into view. Even though she had been here yesterday, she still couldn't accept that such a place existed so close to the city, where people lived impoverished and despair. "'Mr. Thompson, are you home?' she called out, entering the elderly man's hovel. "'Yes, I'm here,' he replied, emerging from the darkness with a spoon in his hand. "'How's our patient?' Whitney asked, shifting her gaze to the vagrant sitting in a chair. "'As you can see, he's alive,' replied Mr. Thompson, gesturing towards him with his spoon. "'He's been awake since morning, as if nothing had happened.' Whitney stepped forward, examining the homeless man. He was tall, thin, with anxiety in his eyes. He wore a dirty jacket, frayed pants, and scuffed shoes. Hello, Whitney whispered, unsure what else to say. Good afternoon, the man replied, looking at her with large, sad eyes. Thank you for rescuing me. I feel noticeably better today. You're welcome, Whitney replied, lowering her eyes awkwardly. I was just doing my job. And what's your name? The stranger asked, gingerly rising from his chair. Whitney, Fallow, she replied, somewhat embarrassed. And you? I'm Joe, answered the man. Just Joe. Okay, Joe, Whitney smiled, feeling her usual demeanour return. What happened to you? Tell Whitney what happened to you the other day, Mr. Thompson suggested. The man clenched and unclenched his fingers, as if fidgeting with invisible beads, and began his story hesitantly. You know, I thought life had given up on me. I haven't had a job in a long time, and I have less and less strength to carry boxes. And they don't hire me everywhere. Whitney nodded, understanding. Well, a couple of days ago, Joe continued, I saw an ad. The firm Elada needed movers. I thought maybe it would work out after all. Joe stood up and took a few steps around the room, as if revisiting the past in his memory. So I filled out the form and then I was called by, well, the head of the department, I guess. Dave Vallow was his name. Suit, tie, ring on his finger. And a face, you know, so arrogant, haughty. A pretty girl was hanging around him all the time. At this point, Joe paused as if reliving those unpleasant moments. But Whitney at that moment almost lost her senses. After all, it was her husband with some beauty. Was it really true? Meanwhile, Joe continued. Well, they said they didn't want a deadbeat like me, and they'd already found a suitable candidate. Really? Whitney asked, surprised, barely containing her anger. Yes, they began to mock me and drove me away. They said they didn't need such a loader. And then what happened? Whitney asked, almost in tears, no longer caring about the questions. Now she understood where her Dave had disappeared to and what problems he had mentioned in the note. And then, then I went to the river, just to calm down and fish in it. When I got there, I saw a girl fall off a bridge, so I rushed to save her. A tear rolled down Whitney's cheek. It was Bianca Grolman, daughter of millionaire Alfred Grolman. He's looking for his daughter's saviour everywhere he can. Joe didn't seem to believe his ears. And I... But that's... He faltered. I mean, it was just an accident. An accident. Whitney grinned. It was fate. You didn't just save a girl. You saved a rich man's daughter. Joe looked at her in silence, as if not knowing what to do next. "'You should go to Mr. Grolman,' Whitney said. "'He must know who saved his daughter.' Joe sighed, a shadow of embarrassment flicking in his eyes. 
I don't know, he muttered. I was just helping. I don't want anything in return. Whitney took his hand. You deserve a reward. You saved a life at the risk of your own. You should get what's rightfully yours. He looked at her with pleading eyes. I can't. Just trust me, she said, and instantly she was out the door. A few hours later, three huge black SUVs arrived at Mr. Thompson's shack. Joe, come out here, please, called an authoritative voice. The tramp stepped outside and saw a tall, burly man in an expensive suit. Hello? I'm Alfred Grohlman, the businessman introduced himself, extending his hand. Thank you very much for saving my daughter, and I am going to offer you whatever you want. Thank you, but I don't need anything, Joe replied, shaking Mr. Grohlman's hand. Don't be modest, smiled the businessman. I know that's not true. I'm ready to offer you a new place to live and a job. A new place to live? marvelled Joe. Yes, confirmed Mr. Grohlman. That's right, and a lot more. Thank you, but it's a little awkward. I saved your daughter without any counting on reward. You need a roof over your head, the businessman insisted. So don't refuse. Consider the matter resolved. Thank you, repeated Joe, barely holding back his tears. It's settled then, said Mr. Grohlman. We'll see each other again. My manager will take care of all matters afterward. The businessman kept his word. He gave Joe a job in his firm, where he became head of the warehouse. It was a good, quiet job that allowed him to feel confident about his future. Whitney, not waiting for her fleeting husband, filed for divorce and soon tied her life to Joe. The house given by millionaire Mr. Grohlman was very cosy. It had a large kitchen where Whitney and Joe sat in the evenings, talking about everything under the sun. A spacious living room, bathroom and bedroom, their refuge, a place of love and tenderness. A few months later, they got married. There was no lavish celebration, only the closest friends and relatives, including Peter, Mr. Thompson and Luca. But it was the happiest wedding ever. Whitney, Joe, took her hand. We've talked so often about having a baby. Do you think we're ready? Whitney smiled, her heart filled with love and happiness. Joe, she said, I want to adopt a child from the orphanage. He was taken aback, having never considered adoption. But after a few seconds, he realised exactly who Whitney wanted and supported her. Good, he said, winking at his spouse. Let's do it, especially since we already have one boy in mind. Whitney smiled. She was glad that Luca would finally get a chance at a normal life. At first, Luca was shy, unable to believe he would have a real family. But Joe and Whitney patiently convinced him that they loved him and would take care of him. Luca, Whitney said, hugging him, you're our family now. You have us and we will never leave you. He cried boyish tears of joy, love and gratitude. Luca felt happier than he had ever felt before. Soon after they became a family, Dave was finally arrested. As it turned out that he, together with his mistress, committed a financial crime at work. Although they had run away, justice caught up with them. Whitney, on the other hand, was happy that it was all finally over. She was free from her heavy past and could live in the present and dream of the future. Whitney watched Joe playing with their son in the garden, her heart filled with gratitude for all that had happened in her life. She loved her boys with all her soul and knew that they would be together until the end. Joe, she whispered, looking at him, I'm so glad I have you. Her husband looked up and smiled. He was happy too.